previous two lectures looked at the propriety and effectiveness of punishment in general. And our questions were, what ethical considerations bear on punishment? Like, what, what kinds of moral thoughts should we have about punishment? And if we don't have free will, is there a way to justify punishment? Or what kinds of punishment could, what kinds of punishments could be ethically justified if we don't have free will? And we also considered what kinds of punishment might actually work. In these final two lectures, we'll take a closer look at moral and legal responsibility especially in light of current work in cognitive science. Today's lecture takes up a particular case study in legal and moral responsibility. That is, should psychopaths be held morally responsible for their actions? This question has attracted renewed attention in recent years because our understanding of psychopathy has increased significantly over the last 15 years. The emerging evidence indicates that psychopaths have a kind of moral deficit and it seems to be tied to a kind of emotional deficit. And this has given us a very different picture of the nature of the problem with psychopaths. But let's start with some of the relevant legal background. In the law, the question of whether a person can be responsible is not put in terms of free will. The closest analog to free will that we have in the law where the question is, is, does this person have free will, that question doesn't show up, but we do get the question, does the person count as sane? And that's probably the closest proxy we have in the law. The stipulation that the defendant has to be sane is, in some sense, of course, the basis for the insanity defense. In the U.S., the model penal code provides the framework for state law. This is a sort of um, set of, of rules that provides the framework for states developing their legal systems. And it includes an influential clause that addresses legal sanity. And that clause, clause reads, a person is not responsible for criminal conduct if at the time of such conduct, as a result of mental disease or defect, he lacks substantial capacity to appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct. One kind of case here that's supposed to show that someone lacks the relevant kind of sanity, isn't sane in the right way, would be florid mental illness. So, for instance, in 1999, in the state of Utah versus Herrera, Thomas Herrera was acquitted of killing his ex-girlfriend because he was suffering from Copgrass syndrome, which is associated with schizophrenia in certain cases. People with Copgrass syndrome tend to think that their loved ones have been replaced by imposters. So they'll recognize the person and they'll say, that person looks exactly like my mom, but it's not really my mom. My mom has really been replaced by an imposter, and that thing there, that's not my mom, even though she looks just like her. Well, Herrera had been diagnosed with this, and he was said to have thought that when he killed his ex-girlfriend, he didn't think it was a person. As a result, he didn't meet the condition of appreciating that the act was wrong, since he didn't even think he was killing a human being. Most states have a, this kind of sanity clause in their legal codes, and it provides the basis for the insanity defense. Actually, the, the fuller claim in the model penal code says that a person is not responsible if he, quote, lacks substantial capacity either to appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct or to conform his conduct to the requirements of law. But most states took the part about lacking the capacity to conform out of their statutes after the trial of John Hinckley, the man who shot President Reagan. Hinckley was found not guilty by reason of insanity, and so a lot of states wanted to tighten up their insan the, the sanity clause so that you wouldn't be able to get out for those sorts of reasons. So they wanted to modify the sanity requirement. So now, the sanity requirement in most states is simply put in terms of an inability to appreciate the wrongfulness of the act. If a person can't appreciate the wrongfulness of their act, then they don't count as legally sane. Now one might worry that this defense would apply to psychopaths who are notorious for persistent and remorseless criminal behavior. Because you might think that already suggests that they don't appreciate the wrongfulness of their action that their persistent criminality might be taken to reveal a failure to appreciate the gravity of their actions. But the model penal code is, has a built-in response to this. It already directly addresses this problem um, in the following bit. It says, 
The terms mental disease or defect do not include an abnormality manifested only by repeated criminal or otherwise antisocial conduct. That is, you can't defend a client by saying, obviously Jones doesn't appreciate the wrongfulness of his action because look at how many bad things he's done. So, although the sanity requirement in the law looks like it might provide a basis for excusing psychopaths, if it turns out that they have a mental disease or defect that present, prevents them from appreciating the wrongfulness of their actions, that is, if you could demonstrate that they have such a mental disease or defect. But the model penal code safeguards against any quick arguments like this, any quick argument that says, oh, we have to excuse psychopaths just because they are so persistently bad. The model penal code says, no, that's not going to work. To excuse psychopaths would require some kind of more compelling evidence that they do have a mental disease or defect. The fact that they behave so badly isn't enough. Over the last 20 years, we've achieved a much better understanding of psychopathy. And there's now some basis, apart from their criminal behavior, for thinking of psychopaths as having a mental defect. But the first thing that we need to put in place here is a bit of background about the clinical measures of psychopathy, the way psychologists and clinicians determine whether or not someone counts as psychopathic. And there's a standard clinical measure for diagnosing psychopathy. It's called the psychopathy checklist. It's 20 items describing either traits or behavior patterns, things the person has done, and the score on those 20 items, depending on how high you score, that determines whether or not the individual is categorized as a psychopath. Now, examples of the traits from the checklist include things like the following. A grandiose sense of self-worth, pathological lying, conning manipulative, lack of remorse or guilt, callous lack of empathy, failure to accept responsibility for your own actions, and people who score highly on these traits, who have a lot of these traits, end up getting diagnosed as psychopaths. Psychopathy is not the same condition as antisocial personality disorder, which is described, which is the, the sort of closest analog that you find in the standard diagnostic manual used by um, American psychologists, the, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, um, uh, Diagnosis Manual. Antisocial personality disorder, um, unlike psychopathy, is really focused on criminal behavior. And the psychopathy checklist is largely, at least half of it, is focused just on personality characteristics like callousness, lack of empathy, lack of remorse. Those are features that you could have even if you weren't a repeat criminal or something like that. Just having the trait of not being sensitive to other people's suffering that's something that would distinguish you even if you, didn't, even if you didn't carry out the behavior that would make you get a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder. Now, of course, psychopaths are also known to commit horrendous crimes. But they seem not to have the typical revulsion that normal people have at hurting other people. In some groundbreaking work in the 1990s, James Blair, who's now at the National Institutes of Health, showed that psychopaths respond atypically to standard kinds of questions about morality. There was a large body of work in developmental psychology that started emerging in the late 70s and early 80s that showed that young children distinguish between what you might think of as, as classic moral violations like pulling hair or kicking or hitting someone and classic conventional violations like talking in class or standing up during story time. So in the standard experiments, the, they would ask kids, um, they'd say, well, uh, is it okay for Johnny to hit Billy? And kids say, no, it's not okay for Johnny to hit Billy. And they'll say, well, is it okay for Susie to stand up during story time? And again, the kids will say, no, it's not okay for Susie to stand up during story time. But then you press a little further and you say, well, how serious is it um, if Johnny hits Billy? And kids tend to say, well, that, that's very serious. Um, they, they give slightly less serious judgments. They're slightly, they think it's slightly less serious if Susie stands up during story time. But then a really interesting question was developed, and that is they would ask the kids, what if the teacher didn't have a rule against standing up during story time or against talking in class? What about that? What if the teacher didn't have a rule against talking in class? Would it be okay to talk in class? 
And then most kids say, yeah, I, if there's no rule against it, then it's fine. But if you say, what if the teacher didn't have a rule against pulling hair? Would it be okay for Joni to push Ma pull Mary's hair? And kids there tend to say, no, it's not okay for Joni to pull Mary's hair, even if the teacher doesn't have a rule against it. Relatedly, if you ask kids, why is it wrong for Susie to stand up during story time? They'll say, well, it's against the rules, or you're just not supposed to do that sort of thing. Whereas if you ask kids, why is it wrong for Joni to pull Mary's hair? They'll say, well, because that would hurt Mary. Blair found when he did experiments on children who had psychopathic tendencies, he found that they responded differently than other children to some of these questions. In particular, children with psychopathic tendencies were more likely to say, well, if the teacher doesn't have a rule against hitting, then I guess it's okay to hit. Children who had serious sort of um, behavior problems but weren't diagnosed as having psychopathic tendencies were significantly more likely to say, no, it doesn't matter whether the, te the teacher has a rule against pulling hair. You still shouldn't pull hair. And you shouldn't pull hair because it hurts the person. Now, Blair found that adult psychopathic criminals also responded differently to these kinds of questions than non-psychopathic non criminals. Now, in the particular study that I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, he did this in England, and all of the participants were prisoners in England, and almost all of them were in prison for murder. In fact, every, every one of the non-psychopathic criminals was in prison for murder, and I think 90% of the psychopaths were in prison for murder. And the interesting thing, the particularly interesting thing that emerged from these studies is he asked them the standard moral conventional kinds of questions. And when he asked them, why is it wrong to hurt other people? The non-psychopathic criminals gave the typical response, which is, well, because you shouldn't hurt people. So why shouldn't you hit people or pull hair? Well, because it hurts them, and that's not fair. It's not right to do that to people. But when he asked psychopaths, why is it wrong to hit another person? He said that the typical response was, well, it's not the done thing, which is the, the British equivalent, basically, to you're not supposed to. And if you'll remember, children, even very young children, don't say that when they're asked, why shouldn't, you know, Susie pull Mary's hair? They don't say, well, because you're not supposed to. They say, because it hurts Mary. That's why you shouldn't do it. So what Blair's studies show is that psychopaths seem to fail to appreciate the deeper sense of wrongness that we all accord to certain violent, harmful actions. We take them to be very serious, important, and not dependent on the rules of a teacher or anything like that. This lack of appreciation of the difference between moral violations and these other kinds of conventional violations is actually captured in a remark of serial killer and presumed psychopath Ted Bundy. Um, in interviews from prison, he listed a number of things that he said are wrong, and so this is a direct quote. He says, it is wrong for me to jaywalk. It is wrong to rob a bank. It is wrong to break into other people's houses. It is wrong for me to drive without a driver's license. It is wrong not to pay your parking tickets. It is wrong not to vote in elections. It is wrong to intentionally embarrass people. In showing off his knowledge of so many different things that are wrong, Bundy is Although, presumably inadvertently, he's revealing something deep about his psychology. Normal people would never lump together jaywalking and bank robbery or parking violations and breaking into people's houses. That We don't think those two things, those, those kinds of violations, fall into the same category. So Bundy's comment here, where he fuses all this together, seems to illustrate exactly the point made by Blair's study. Psychopaths have a seriously deficient understanding of moral violations. They don't appreciate the gravity of moral violations. Now, they do know right from wrong in some sense. That is, if you just gave them a list of things and you said, how many of things, these things count as wrong, they would be able to go through and list them. I mean, if you think about Bundy's list, he's right that all of the things he mentions count as wrong. But what they fail to appreciate, what psychopaths fail to appreciate, is they don't appreciate, at least not fully, the difference between the different kinds of wrong. So one way we might put it is that even though they might know right from wrong in some sense, they don't know wrong from wrong. They don't know conventional wrong from moral wrong. They fail to appreciate the distinctive character of moral wrongness. And that's something that normal people do from a very young age.
The studies suggest that certainly four-year-olds are doing this. Four-year-olds are great at distinguishing things like hitting people from standing up during story time. And it might even emerge by the third birthday. So this is something that shows up really early. It's also found in children who are developmentally delayed and children with autism. So the psychopath's blindness here is really distinctive. It has nothing to do with general intelligence or with some kind of failure to understand other people. Blair goes further at this point and offers an emotion-based explanation for why psychopaths show this pattern of response. He maintains that it results from a lack of emotional responsiveness. And he investigated this by showing pictures of a crying child and then measuring physiological response. So if you see these pictures, normal adults, I mean, if you see these pictures, they're really upsetting. You get, you get worked up when you see the pictures of the child who's really distressed and suffering. He finds that Physiological measures show that normal adults and ch young children and individuals with autism all show heightened physiological response when they look at these pictures of suffering children. But psychopaths show significantly less physical response than non-psychopaths. So they're less sensitive to these cues of suffering than the rest of us. More recently, using brain monitoring instruments, Blair finds that psychopaths have abnormally low activity in the amygdala, which is a, a part of the brain that's pretty deep inside the brain, and it's associated with emotional response. Blair's theory is that the problem with psychopaths' moral understanding, the reason they perform atypically on these judgments about whether it's okay to hit Johnny, for Johnny to hit Billy, is because of their, def their deficient emotional reaction, that that's why they have the deficient moral response. And this now gives the basis for a scientific characterization of psychopaths as having a mental disease or defect. In addition, many researchers now maintain that there is a strong genetic component to whether or not someone is a psychopath. Part of the evidence cited in favor of this comes from twin studies that look at the coincidence of psychopathic tendencies in identical or monozygotic twins as compared to fraternal, fraternal or dizygotic twins. If psychopathy has a genetic component, then it should be more common in identical twins than in fraternal twins, even if they have the same environments or similar environments. And the available evidence suggests that you get significantly greater incidence of psychopathy in identical twins than in fraternal twins. So here's a broad picture of the psychopath's mental disease or defect. Certainly not confirmed, but it's also certainly suggested by the current evidence. That there's some genetic abnormality in these individuals that leads them to have abnormal development of the amygdala. That mechanism of the brain is important for emotion processing. And so they show a, a resultant defect in emotion processing, in particular emotion processing of suffering in other people that processing is significantly diminished as compared to normal people. In normal people, Blair would say, our emotional sensitivity to other suffering plays a critical role in developing a normal appreciation of the wrongfulness of violent offenses. It's because we have these feelings that we come to assign such seriousness and significance to hitting and killing other people. Because psychopaths have diminished sensitivity they fail to develop a normal sense of the distinctive wrongfulness of harming and killing others. These experimental results have recently been invoked to argue that psychopaths should not be held morally and legally responsible. And the basic argument is that since psychopaths have a diminished understanding of what it is for something to be morally wrong, this suggests that they lack the relevant kind of knowledge to be held responsible for immoral actions. In addition, you might think, well, maybe this shows that they don't meet the, the test of legal sanity after all. Indeed, one term that has sometimes been used to describe psychopaths is that they're morally insane. They don't appreciate the wrongfulness of their actions in the right way. They fail to appreciate how serious it is to hurt another person. Rather, they assimilate moral violations to these sort of typical conventional violations. So to go back to Ted Bundy, what he said suggested that jaywalking and bank robbery were on a par. Anyone who thought that lacks some crucial element of moral understanding. 
So the argument goes like this. If Joe robs a bank and we learn that he sees no significant difference between violations like bank robbery and jaywalking, then Joe evidently does not meet the legal test of sanity. If he thinks bank robbery is no worse than jaywalking, then he doesn't really appreciate the wrongfulness of his robbing the bank. Now previously one might have said that the mere fact that Joe doesn't see the seriousness of his act doesn't entail that he's legally insane because you also need to show that it comes from a mental disease or defect. But now, the argument goes, we can identify the defect. We have a story about how Joe's defect arises from an emotional dysfunction. On top of this, one might add that psychopaths didn't have any control over this feature of their psychology. It seems to be a developmental disorder caused by abnormalities in the amygdala. And this abnormality in the amygdala is, is thought to have a largely genetic basis. And obviously, psychopaths didn't choose their genes. So, psychopaths criminally hurt people because they have a deficiency in their emotional sensitivity to others' pain. But this deficiency was never under their control. It was largely the result of genetics. So, to repeat the argument, psychopaths fail to appreciate the wrongfulness of their actions. This comes from a mental disease or defect, and the defect has a genetic basis. Thus, the argument concludes they shouldn't be held morally or legally responsible for their criminal callousness. This is a pretty disturbing result. The people who seem most evil, most heinous, would, according to this argument, get a free pass. Well, not really a free pass. We'd still need to impose social control. But they should, on this argument, get excused from any retributive penalties since they don't count as legally sane. They don't count as fully, fully equipped to be held fully morally responsible in the legal system. Now, there are some broadly scientific issues that might be, might be brought to bear to cast doubt on this argument. So one response is that psychopaths have only a diminished understanding of morality. It's not completely absent. So if you look closer at the data, you see that children with psychopathic tendencies do distinguish the moral violations from the conventional ones. It's just that their appreciation of the distinction is diminished as compared with other children. Now, I think it's still very interesting that their moral understanding is diminished. And it's an important fact if we want to understand the nature of moral judgment. But it's an exaggeration to say that they have no understanding of morality at all based on this evidence. And it might be that having some minimal understanding of morality will be sufficient to meet the test of sanity. Another question is whether it's apt to regard psychopaths as having a mental disease or defect. Although the evidence clearly indicates that psychopaths are abnormal, it's less clear that they count as mentally ill. One common observation about psychopaths is that they don't regard themselves as mentally ill. Rather, they think that it makes perfect sense to put, one's own in, to put one's own interests very far in front of anyone else's. One psychopathy researcher tells a story about having to deal with a patient in a prison who found out that he'd been diagnosed as psychopathic. The patient was very upset to find out that he was diagnosed as psychopathic because it changes the way he's treated. And so he challenged the researcher and said, why was I diagnosed as psychopathic? And the researcher brought out the checklist and said, well, you know, I asked you this question and this was your answer. And he went through the checklist. And afterwards, the guy said, well, of course I'm a psychopath. Anybody who, who wouldn't answer the questions that way is just a sap. So it looks like psychopaths fully embrace the idea, at least many of them, fully embrace the idea that they're psychopaths. And they don't regard themselves as having some kind of defect. They think that's the right way to be. The late psychologist Linda Mealy, who lived from 1955 to 2002, argued that psychopathy is not, properly speaking, a mental illness. It's not the product of brain damage or anything like that. Rather, she says, it's a biological trait that can actually be advantageous for the psychopath, not, not for us. Her argument draws on the idea of what's called an evolutionary stable strategy. Recall the idea of game theory from lecture 13, the idea is that what's best for a given individual will depend on the other members of the population. In lecture 13, we focused on particular behaviors, but it can also hold true for traits that are permanent or fixed in an individual. 
And we can illustrate this with this, the familiar example of hawks and doves from that lecture. Hawks fight viciously in conflicts over resources. Doves retreat immediately from conflicts and therefore they don't get injured. Now let's suppose that whether an individual is a hawk or a dove is genetically fixed. It's a stable feature of the individual. In a population that is entirely composed of hawks, being a dove will give one an advantage because in that population every conflict leads to a vicious fight. Of course, in a population composed entirely of doves, being a hawk will give one an advantage because one will always win in every contest. The dove will back down. So the population, the theory says the population will evolve to include both hawks and doves in some stable state, evolutionary stable state. Mealy says you get something similar in humans. If everyone is sympathetic to other people, then that creates an opportunity for a new group to come in and take advantage, to step in and exploit the sympathetic behavior of others. You might think of this as a niche that's available to be filled. So just like if everyone is a dove, then it'll be easy for a hawk to come in and clean up. So too, if everyone is moral, then it will be easy for an amoralist, like the psychopath, to clean up. So she says, it might have been a natural evolutionary development for psychopaths to emerge. And if that's right, psychopathy is not a developmental defect or a product of brain damage or disadvantaged childhood. Instead, it's an evolved response to exploit a niche in the population. It's a trait that basically works to take advantage of the rest of us. Now, this is all really speculative, but it makes especially clear that it remains an open question whether psychopathy should be thought of as a mental disease or defect or simply as a different way of being. So those are some ways to challenge on sort of theoretical scientific bases whether or not we should draw this, this sort of disturbing conclusion that we have to absolve psychopaths from responsibility. There are also some more philosophical questions about whether psychopaths should get special treatment on issues of moral and legal responsibility. So let's just start out with the idea that let's suppose that you're a free will skeptic. You don't believe in free will at all. Then you might think that, well, although psychopaths differ from us in significant ways, none of those ways bear on the free will debate. We are no more free and responsible than psychopaths. On this line of reasoning, since psychopaths are no less free than we are, they don't merit any special treatment. Or to put it the other way, in terms of free will and responsibility, psychopaths are no worse off than we are. We're all in the same dismal boat of lacking free will. In lecture 21, we saw that free will skeptics sometimes promote a quarantine approach to punishment. On that view, just as we quarantine the dangerously contagious for the good of society, so too we need to quarantine the criminally dangerous. On this account, it presumably makes no difference whether the dangerous individual is psychopathic or not. Anyone who poses a criminal threat gets quarantined. Of course, it might be that the right way to think about this is that on a quarantine model, what we do is we treat everyone the way humanitarians promote treatment of psychopaths. On their view, it's wrong to treat psychopaths as if they're fully morally responsible. According to someone who's skeptical about free will, it's wrong to treat anyone that way. Now suppose, on the other hand, you think that people do have free will in this robust libertarian sense that we've seen. In that case, presumably psychopaths have it too. There's nothing in the evidence that suggests that psychopaths differ from us on that dimension. A libertarian might well think that psychopaths are missing some of the motivation for refraining from harm. But psychopaths still make a choice in light of their motivations, and they're responsible for making that choice. The fact that they have less intrinsic repulsion at other suffering doesn't erase their responsibility. Recall that libertarians are happy to acknowledge that our free decisions are influenced by numerous factors that are not in our control. And so they can say, well, with psychopaths, here's an additional factor that's not in their control. But it doesn't mean that they're not making free choices. Finally, to return to the issue of legal sanity, even if psychopaths fail to appreciate the distinctively immoral nature of their actions, they still appreciate that the actions are forbidden by society. So Bundy was aware that all of these things were sanctioned, the, all of these things there were rules against in society. They're competent at a minimum with conventional violations. So 
if they have free will, then it seems like they can make free choices about whether or not to flout the laws that they know full well. They know the laws perfectly well. And that may well be enough to make them legally responsible. That is, we may be able to hold them legally responsible simply because they know that what they're doing is against the law. One concluding thought that I want to, um, to make concerns the idea that, as I said, psychopaths seem like the best example of someone who's distinctively evil, the best case of someone who's evil. If psychopaths are determined to be the way they are, if determinism is true and they're determined to be the way they are, can they really count as evil? It seems like there's a problem in calling them evil if they're determined to be the way they are. And even if they're not determined to be the way they are, it looks like there's an important genetic contribution to their being so awful. And so a critical part of what makes them so very bad was not freely chosen. And so we continue to face the question whether psychopaths truly count as evil.